I'm going to tell you something. After watching these videos of these guys in Bible school, I'm thinking about taking some of y'all, bringing y'all up here on a Wednesday yeah, night. Yeah, amen. Angela, what, what were you doing the other day talking about how you were nervous? Honey, I'm fixing to put you up here on Wednesday night. That You did a fan. I mean, listen, I mean, all those guys in there, Chloe, oh, my gosh. I mean, these guys just knocked the ball out of the park. Amen. I thought, dear Lord, what am I doing teaching them? They ought to be preaching to me. Amen. Mm. They did a fantastic job. Well, tonight I'm going to introduce my son, but before I do, I want to give you a little history. Lisa and I have made up our mind when the boys were grown, growing up to never mention the call of God on their life. Mm -hmm. Now, why do we do that? Number one, because then if I call them, then I've got to be responsible for them. I don't want them to have daddy call them. God has to speak to them. And they have to know the Lord did it. Because when things get tough, I don't want them coming to me. I want them going to the Lord. Well, I know that God used Mark Hankins to minister to Justin. And the reason why is that because of familiarity, you know, sometimes your own parents, you're in the house with them all the time. It's better for God to use an outside source. So God used Mark Hankins to minister to Justin. And, he, and he's used Dr. Varallo in a lot of instances talking to Justin and ministering to him. As a matter of fact, she calls him more than she does me and Lisa. <laughs> and so um, they talk a lot. Well, Justin, um, you know, a lot of times people think that, you know, we put him in ministry because he's our son. I wouldn't have put him in ministry if he didn't have a call of God. I wouldn't care who he was. If he don't have the, if God didn't put it on him, I don't, I don't want him up here. I'd rather him go do something else with his life, whatever God called him to do. So I want him to find that out. But anyway, Justin's been, um, he stepped into more of an office of a prophet right off of the bat. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. He does a lot of praying, and he has lots of dreams. And the thing about it is, I, I guess all of them, to the best of my ability that I know of, come to pass. And he'll come to me and say, I had a dream about so-and-so. And I go, okay, we'll see. You know, in a month later, two months later, three months later, what he dreamed happens. And he'll, he'll even tell me stuff that's going on in this church. And I'm the pastor. <laughs> and, uh, and I take it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let the cat out of the bag right now. If Lisa doesn't mind, she may holler at me. I don't know. But, um, but how long was it when you had a dream about Rick Renner? It's been a few weeks. Been a few weeks ago. Well, you know, you put that on the shelf, and you don't say much about it. But when Lisa and I were in West Palm, we just celebrated 36 years of being married. So I drug Lisa out of here and took her up to West Palm Beach. The ocean was cold, and so the swimming pool was cold. Everything was cold, but we had a good time. We, we, we got to get away. So I had a dream about Rick Renner, very, very vivid dream. So I called Cindy Duval to schedule them coming in August. And she mentioned um, that Rick Renner had a Wednesday night open if he comes to America. Because sometimes leaving Russia, he doesn't, he doesn't know if he's going to get to leave or not. So that's up in the air. And I don't know whether he's going to say yes or not. But I'm going to get you to agree because I think the Lord is leading me to have Rick Renner come. Now, I'm going to tell you all something, that's, and I was talking to Cindy Duval today, and I said, she said, that's probably the Holy Ghost. I think it is. Now, you, you do not, don't try to create relationships. You will find yourself butting your head against a wall. God puts you in supernatural relation. He wants you to know someone. He'll put you in their path. Amen. And that's how it's been with me and, and Lisa and Dr. Varallo and Mark Hankins and Trina and the people that God has Lisa and I running around with. And they have been a, a great blessing to our life. Well, um, Rick Renner is probably one of the smartest people you'll ever meet in your life. And uh, he's got a church in Moscow and a Bible school and a world ministry and I don't know if you know who he is. If you don't, you ought to get his books. They're, um, they're fantastic. 
But um, so that, that, you know, I'm just telling you that to introduce my guest speaker. <laughs> but to get you to get in agreement with me that, and, and I guess this is one of those times you say, Father, if that's you, then make this happen. Now, if that happens, it, 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 I'm going to tell you something. It'll be a God thing. Because I think there's something God is, God is doing something bigger here in this church than even me and Lisa. Y'all need to know that. You need to know it's not a Daryl church. It's a, his church. And he's doing something way bigger than, I, than I've ever imagined. So anyway, having said that, because of uh, Justin's obedience to God, I'm going to tell you, uh, he prays a lot. He reads a lot. He studies a lot, and he's very dedicated to the call of God that's on his life. And I want you to know it is a great honor for me to introduce you to you, Justin Morgan. Thank you, Pastor. I was telling Dad, because um, he walked in today and said, I had a dream last night, and I said, oh, tell me. He said, I saw Rick Renner. And I said, do you remember me telling you in the office about a few weeks ago? Maybe It could have been maybe a month or two. Rick Renner was in, in my dream in this church preaching. And so he was doing his, it, and it was, it felt like a Sunday morning that he was here. And Alex was at the door and, you know, Rick went back. And then my sisters, both of them came in and went back. And, you know, they were trying to steal all the attention and be, you know, hey, how you doing, Rick? And talking and whatnot. And I'm kind of running around. And so we go back in the office and it's me, Che, Ashley, dad, and mom talking to brother Rick. And then somebody knocks on the office door and says, hey, there's a problem in the parking lot. So I walk outside, we go to the parking lot, and it's just chaos. There's just all kinds of crazy stuff. So I told Dad we need to be praying because, you know, when that happens, you're going to have all kinds of devils and things are going to come try to stop that, disrupt the service because of the call of God and the anointing that he's going to bring in here and the message he's going to bring. And so really we, got, we need to cover that in prayer. But I, I do believe that um, that's him. That I had dreams of Brother Jonathan before he came. And Dad and I would talk, and we, you know, we kind of throw it around and say, "What do you think about John on the shadow of the earth?" I don't know. So then, as we would kind of sit on it, well, then one night I go down to Tampa with uh, Pastor Jeannie, and I never go to the river. So, but one time I went, and um, I told a buddy of mine, "Hey, I'm going to be at the river tonight. It'd be cool to see you." Well, he went and told one of the pastors that I'm coming, and I had just gotten ordained like a month ago. And um, he, I get there, and he said, "Hey, by the way, I, we uh, we have a meeting scheduled with you and Brother Jonathan." And I said, I didn't ask for that. He said, oh, I know, but we did it for you. And we said, you were going to meet a pastor. He was like, oh, I saw online that you got ordained through Pastor Mark. And he's like, that's great. So he said, yeah, he's going to be waiting for you after the service. And I'm like, no, I just was trying to kind of hide, like you guys do, slide in the back and just listen and not be up too close to the front. And um, there, you know, we just sit right in the front, and Dr. Rodney is walking right in front of my chair, and I can't go sit down because he's standing in front of my chair, and I'm like, oh, man, he's going to call me out as soon as I walk back. And then after the service, John and the shuttles were just sitting in a little chair in the back, and he's just waiting for me. And so it was just like this divine appointment that God just went whoosh. As you're going to be right here at this time, and you need to meet this person. And he's, I mean, John and the Shuttlesworth, just sitting there waiting. I, I was like, I mean, who am I? But... To see where that had gone to then, you know, we met him and I talked a little bit. I was like, wow, he's a genuine guy. He's really nice. You know, he doesn't seem like, you know, the stereotypical what people say about preachers. And um, then I watched him preach another service and in my heart I told dad, I says, we're supposed to have him. I keep having dreams about him here, him stepping off of a jet or something. And that time he hadn't started flying uh, private yet. So then that all that happened, and so I just write these things down in a little journal, and I just shelf them, and I pray over them, and I don't run around and tell anybody, because really I think that's like intimacy between me and the Lord. I think that if I went and started telling everybody, he would stop giving them to me. That's how I feel. So I tell dad, I say, hey, let me just run this by you. What do you think this is? Sometimes he says, well, you know, if it's God, it's not, shelf it. So I just, and I enjoy, and then Mary Fran said to me when she was here, she said, um, that's the language he's been speaking to you as a child. You've always had dreams and visions. And I, and I have remembered um, as a kid, maybe I didn't always remember them very well, but she said it's been this way your entire life. And so I think that my heart was more closed off when I was younger because I didn't want to be in ministry, so a lot of them kind of subsided. But once I kind of said, okay, Lord, I'll do it, it's like a lot of the stuff opened back up. And plus, there, there's things you can pray. Uh, one of the things Mary Fran told me is she says, 
pray, give me dreams and visions if it pleases the Father tonight and protect my body as I sleep. And so there's a scripture in Psalms, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. And the morning is to God, it's like two, three, four o'clock in the morning. It's usually the time that you're dreaming. And, I, and mom doesn't ever dream, dad sometimes, but man, for me, it's like it's every night. And some of it's just crazy. I just like, ah, I don't think that's God. I think that's just my, you know, pizza or something, whatever. Or just a conversation you're having. But then there's ones that I'm like, Brother Copeland's in this dream? I'm going to meet Brother, oh my glory to God. You know, I'm hanging out with Brother Copeland. I don't know. You know, I just see where the Lord leads me. I just continue to be faithful and to serve and to serve Pastor Mark, serve my dad. And, and um, I'm going to teach tonight on serving, why it's so important. Because I've actually got a revelation of this. I've always served in this church. Not always had the best attitude. But I've always served. And then what's cool is when with Pastor Mark, I really got a revelation of serving and serving men of God. And then it's really not a small thing. And that when I started doing that, it started opening up all these doors in my life and um, opening up avenues with Pastor Mark that I had, you know, I didn't even know this. And I was telling the Bible school students that I used to buy Mary Fran her favorite chocolate um, bar every time she'd come, every year. Cookies and cream. She loves that. So every year I'd buy it for her. I didn't know that that's an act of honor because you're spending your substance on somebody and honor and you're finding things that they like because you're going kind of above the call of duty. You're, it's to treat with great regard, great respect. It's to kind of look at someone and say detail, go, you're putting extra thought into that person. So respect is with words, but when you're honored, you start getting into your substances and uh, how, you, how you really treat that person. And so when I started doing that with her, I didn't know that was gonna open doors. So the, there's a scripture in the Bible that says a man's gift will make room for him. And mom looked at me one time and she says, I've always wondered about that scripture because I always thought that like David playing a harp, how I opened up his gift made room for him for King Saul. But really giving a gift to somebody can open up a door into their life. And it makes room for you in that person's life. So sometimes if you're struggling with a relationship, sometimes giving a gift, somebody said to me one time, oh, you're a... Uh, giving, uh, there's like the five love languages and one's gift. And I said, I might be and I might not, but what I've realized is that scripture, a man's gift makes room for him, means is when I'm sowing into someone's life, I'm looking for an open door and, and just to wherever God may lead that relationship. And so those are kind of cool little things that, I, that we've learned in ministry over the years on, on the spiritual laws that really, they, they just can't be broken. And uh, they've made tremendous impact in my life. And so, hey, you know, if the Lord wants to give it to me, then praise God. You stay humble. You stay small in your own eyes. You give him glory. But I don't think it's to run around and say, oh, man, I'm prophet so-and-so and I have dreams and visions. Because I've never seen Mary Fran do that. And to me, she's more, um, her and Mark Hankins never do that. And to me, they're the way that God uses them. And I see these guys on TV sometimes, and they call themselves prophet so-and-so. And I'm going to prophesy this today. And I'm not saying all that's bad, but sometimes I wonder What's the heart motive to, to trying to, everybody knows Mary Fran's a prophet. The woman just walks in the room and, and you know, when I was a kid, I'd be repenting of my sins before she got here. She, she just say, we just say, you know, uh, Minister Mary Fran, we'd, be, we'd never called her prophet, but everybody knew she was it because she carried that anointing, and that office on her. So uh, I think how you honor, you so honor into people is really how you'll receive honor. And this is kind of a part of my message is that everybody wants a Timothy in their life or maybe in their business of how Timothy served Saul, uh, Paul, well he was Saul, but they're, way, they're looking too much on where's my Timothy who's gonna serve me instead of being a Timothy. Because you have to serve honor, you have to serve servitude before you're gonna receive it. Because I mean the Bible, everything works in seed time and harvest the whole kingdom of God. So like a farmer sowing seed, I always think, you know, like when I was waxing cars, I'd always go wax mom and dad's car for free because I was sowing a seed of that because I wanted that seed to reproduce after its own kind. So if you own a business, uh, how you serve the person above you, your boss, is really how people are gonna serve you in your company. And so whatever you want in your business, serve people around you, serve your pastor, your church, serve your, uh, where, or the, your boss, or, or whatever you wanna do, whatever you wanna receive back, that's how you're gonna serve. And so you start seeing that with um, Joshua, you see that um, with uh, Elisha, these great men of God and Elisha really got a double portion because of the way he served Elijah. And then when he was on his way out, he said, what do you want? He just said, I just want double of whatever you got. And he said, if the Lord wants to give it to you, if, you, if the Lord seems that what you, how you served is worthy, then you'll, if you see me on the way out, you'll get it. And so Elisha got the double portion of how, because of how he served. Elisha served 
Elijah for six years before he ever saw his own ministry. And so I love something Mark Hagen says in his book, because I'm going to read a little bit. He says the only way really to get the anointing is you have to serve for it. Serve in a move of God. Serve in some kind of way. And so I want to talk a little bit about that tonight. Not saying that I'm an expert on this subject, because there's probably a lot of ways people can serve. And it's not always maybe totally you have to be doing something in the local church um, I think that is a huge part of it. I don't know if we'd have a job for every person right this minute if everybody wanted to serve. I know we are actively working on it. We're revamping different areas, but I love our people that do serve, that come in here, like the Bevels, man. They've always just been, hey, where do you want me? What do you want me to do? Uh, they just come in and they just jump in. And I, I love that kind of that heart because that's really gonna be the heart of David, what puts him, I'm gonna give you a key of David. David was never looking to be king because we're gonna read 1 Samuel 17. His heart was never after the throne. His whole heart was to do what? It was to please God. God says, I'm, I'm looking for a man who's gonna be after my own heart. And so the reason I think David, and the reason he did make it to the throne, is because out of his eight brothers, and Samuel shows up, and he looks at all of them, and Samuel says, this one, this one, no, 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 no. I mean, they're big, they're strong. And God said, I, I've rejected all of them because I'm seeing what's beyond his flesh and I'm looking at his heart. And so tonight I kinda of wanna look at what happened to David to where his heart got that way because somehow the rest of his brothers never got it. And I wonder, you're in the same household, you're in the same family, you're, you're around the same, you're uh, Jesse, which was their dad. How did they not catch that servitude? And you really don't even hear about their brothers anymore in the Bible. You actually hear about Jesus coming through the lineage of David because of the way that he served and the way that he pleased God. And so uh, we're doing the Y series, so I'm gonna go over one thing. Jesus really said that uh, he's the king of kings, and he says the whole kingdom of God is gonna be working by serving. And so really, everything's backwards in the kingdom of God. The way up is gonna be down. The way to prosper is to give. Uh, the way that you want love, you're gonna sow love. And so it's always, uh, to the world, everything's backwards. I told a friend of mine, he said, I don't understand why I have to do this and that. Explain it to me. I said, well, it's God. He doesn't care. He says, this is the way I want to do it. He says, I'll use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So God says, I'm going to make the dumbest thing is how you're going to prosper. You're going to give money away, which is completely stupid to most people. Why you give away, you're going to have less. Well, God's saying, I'm going to put this spiritual law in motion because I want to confound wise people who think they're wise. So, you know, that's kind of just everything. I think in the kingdom of God, if you see the world doing something, just do opposite and you know you're on God's side. <laughs> so the way up is always down. Um, people serve, should serve because they want to, because they love God. We're not, uh, Frank made a good point to me yesterday. You're not saved so you can serve. When you get saved, because of what God did for you, you want to serve. As a, as a gratitude of, hey, uh, you remember where you came from. My destination was hell for eternity, and Jesus bought me with a price. And so, my heart is, I want to, if Jesus said, I've come not that I seek my own honor, but I seek the honor of my Father, or Jesus says, I've come to serve, not to be served, his whole mission is you cannot outperform Jesus. If Jesus is washing the disciples' feet and Peter's feet, then Jesus is saying, you're not going to be above your master. If I'm coming to serve this generation, if I've come to serve and do the will of God, then you are going to be, this is what I've required to serve. Because you're going to see a contention um, Luke twenty two twenty four. 24, I'm going to read this. An eager contention arose among them as to who is going to be considered uh, reputated to be the greatest. This is the Amplified Translation. Jesus said to them, the king of the Gentiles are de defied by what they exercise lordship, ruling as emperor of gods over them and those in authority over them called benefactors and well-doers. But this is not so with you. On the contrary, on the exact opposite, basically how my kingdom is going to run, is let him who is the greatest among you Become like the youngest and let him who is the chief leader like the one who serves. For who he was the greater is one who reclines at the table, the master, or the one who serves. It is not the one who reclines at the table, but I'm in your midst as the one who serves. So Jesus is, the, the disciples are arguing who's going to be the greatest of the kingdom of heaven and sit at the right hand of Jesus. And he said, you guys got it all backwards because of the way that the kings rule from the top down. Whereas in America was built from the bottom up, that the American politician was supposed to serve the local government, the local, um, the mayors, the police chiefs, they served the local areas, and then it went to the state, the, the statesmen would serve the states, and then the state 
was serve the federal government. We're built from the bottom up. That's why, you know, with Justin Trudeau, he has a council chamber of a lot of people in Canada when they had the trucker thing going on. And he could listen to them all. But at the end of the day, if he said, this is what we're doing, they're built off the old King of England type of leadership in Canada still to this day. They've never changed their law. So that's why Jesus is saying from the top down, the kingdom of God is going to be, we're all going to serve from the bottom up. And we're going to serve one another. And so I'm going to read another one, Matthew 20, 25 through 28. Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. Uh, this is just the King James. I'm just going to skip down. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, King James translation says of Matthew 20, 25, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. So it's interesting to see that word is that um, ministering is, is, I mean, something that we all do on a daily basis to people. The Bible says that the fivefold ministry is made up of pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and apostles to do train up the equipping of the saints for what? The work of ministry. So I think one way you serve God is you minister to people. You minister the love of God to people. You tell them about Jesus. You tell them about the goodness of God. And it's not, and I think that's one of the easiest ways to serve God and have a love for God is that you're just saying simply, I'm going to minister either A, to the, to, to the people around me. Um, you know, like I said, if it's, you don't have a position in a church, well, find somebody on your row and say, how can I serve you? How can I minister to them? I mean, if Frank don't see Adam next week, call him up. Where you at? I think that's one way that you can serve your pastor is just reaching out to the people around you and ministering to them. Uh, when Rosie was, is Rosie Corton here tonight? No. When she was out for a few weeks, she said, she felt like she really never m kind of missed church because all the Word of Life people just kept showing up at her door, bringing her food. And really, that that's how it really should be, is they're, they're serving her, going, hey, we understand right now you're in a tough spot. We are here to give our lives to serve you like Jesus served the disciples in his generation. We're here to serve you. And so I think that's one way that if you're like, man, I don't really know a way I can serve in church, just serve the people around you. And I mean, just, I mean, if... Dad always says if somebody could give a simple phone call to somebody around them and find out, hey, where is so-and-so? Because we don't always keep, are able to keep track of everybody. That's one way that you can serve. And I think a lot of the, the will of God for your life, you're going to find out how you're going to serve God. You'll find that out in prayer, where your exact place. Because you're going to have the fivefold ministry. Not everybody's called to the fivefold ministry. There's going to be positions in church. Some people are going to serve with their finances. Like my brother and Dan, I know Dan's here tonight, they're out on a truck, and so they're serving by, by their giving. Some people serve by their efforts and their talents, and so when I, I didn't have a lot of money to give to Pastor Mark, so I just said, hey, uh, I can wax cars. And so I'd go to his meetings, and I'd jump out of the meetings and run to his house, and I'd wax all of his trucks, and just to be a blessing to him, and I didn't know that was going to open up one day to me driving off with one of his trucks. <laughs> and so I said, huh, there's something in this serving thing that I need to learn about because it, it's paying great rewards. That whereas most of Americans, and I think just people in general, because of, as you're a kid, you're just selfish by nature. Take the toy, it's mine. You know, they don't want to give. And you, so as a parent, you've got to break the kid of that and say, no, you need, to, you need to learn to give. It's better to give than to receive. And so I believe that, because um, I'm going to read you something in Brother Jesse's book about heaven, that he talks about how the whole king, how heaven, when he was there, everybody served one another. And I, I read that, and I'm thinking, so then in one part, he said, where are the 12 elders? They're not on the throne. He said, they're all out serving the people. I was like, wow. So when you get to heaven, you're going to be serving one another, because that's what Jesus, I mean, everything you saw Jesus do on earth, I believe, is a reflection of what's coming, and how the body of Christ operates now is what we're going to see. And so let's see if I can read another one. Um, Matthew 19. Peter answered and said, we've all left and followed you. What shall we have? Jesus said, surely I say to you. That in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on the throne of glory, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or wives or children or lands for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. Whoa. Notice he didn't say the pastors who leave. The fivefold ministry. He said no. Everyone who leaves. Everyone who decides to follow Jesus 100% and say, Lord, I'm going to serve you, whatever capacity that is for me, through prayer. He said, if you, if you lay down your own life, 
I'm not only gonna give you a hundredfold in this life, but I'm gonna give you something in the life to come. And so really, and it's, and people, you know, ministers preach the scripture so much that, oh, you know, I'm a pastor and I'm an evangelist and I've left everything to follow Jesus. But in the scripture, he says, everyone who lays down his life to follow Jesus, 100%. I really believe it's really starts as a heart position. You're going, hey, Lord, I remember when I was 17 and I'm driving Steve Stapleton's Silver Sob, and I remember pulling over and saying, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Whatever you want to use me for, you know, I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't, I don't know what I want to do. I have no idea. What do you want to use me for? Just use me for something. And years later, when I was struggling with dad wanting, you know, he, he never really pushed me to preach, but he would say, hey, if you ever want to, and I'd be like, no. I remember having a dream, and the angel said, do you remember the day that you said this? And I was like, oh my gosh, that was years ago. I was 17. And he said, you remember when you said this. So God remembers when you say, Lord, I will do whatever to serve you. Wherever you want me to be, he remembers that. And so I think that that was the day that we call that kind of the, you consecrate your life because salvation is free, but following Jesus is is not gonna be free. You're gonna lay down a lot to say, I'm gonna follow him. Because remember, the rich young ruler he wanted, he did, he followed everything Jesus asked except for one thing, give up all that you have and come follow me. And so I really believe that a lot of Christians, you know, hey, I think going to heaven is great, but really that was not the whole purpose. It was that God would bring you back to the Father and that as Jesus painted a picture of serving, then you were gonna serve uh, as well. So I wanna read something about King David. So it says that in Acts thirteen twenty one. afterwards they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul, the son of a Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And when they had removed him, he raised for them David as a king of whom he gave a testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do, do what? All of my will. And so in Acts 13, 36, for David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, he fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and saw corruption. So basically just a natural death. So. We're gonna to go to 1 Samuel 17. I love something uh, Miss Evelyn Whitmore said last night. She was preaching. Oh man, it was so good. She said the grave should be the emptiest place because after you give everything you have in your life for Jesus, I mean the songs that you're supposed to write, the books you're supposed to write, that you love people, that you've ministered, that you served, then you die and you've left its empty grave. But she said what happens is the grave is so full of the most treasure and talent because so many people go to the grave with just, with things that they never did with their life. And so she said, you should be exhausted at the end of your life of everything you did for Jesus and leave that thing empty. And so I was like, wow, that is, I mean, that is a, a powerful way to think about the, the grave. So I wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about David because in the book of heaven, David shows back up as like a prequel. Is that what that's called, like a prequel, like after? Or is that a sequel? Is that a sequel? It's like the, the, next, the next movie after? Okay. I'm not saying this is doctrine, but he says in the book, he said, read it, and if it resonates in your heart, and there's a lot of scriptures in there that are in the Bible. Uh, This book of heaven is, I read it in like one night, I was telling dad that I said, oh my gosh, when Jesse Duplantis went to heaven, I mean, he just did, um, 11 months ago, he did like a uh, kind of a renewal of preaching the same message, and he said he's only preached it two times, and so, he did like two and a half hours the other day at a church, and I mean, it, it was powerful, and I loved every minute of watching him talk about heaven, because really it's starting to paint a picture for me of what's coming, and how we need to be getting ready, uh, and because I've always asked the Lord, what's the reward system going to be like? What are we going to be doing? And I think this started answering a lot of questions for me, and you know, uh, he just said, you know, you can't make a doctrine out of it, but you can, if it resonates with you, and it's like, you know, that's his, that's his testimony. I'm not gonna say that it's completely Bible because you can't find it in here, but if that is his testimony, it's pretty accurate to this. And I think I'm maybe gonna pay a little, uh, some close attention. But I wanna talk about David because we see a guy who God makes a huge deal about him in the book of Acts, in the book of Hebrews. He talks about David. And so, chapter 17, and I wanna read through this, and it is kind of lengthy, but... I kind of want to paint the entire picture of 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to start with verse 2. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. 
And the champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Uh, on the audio book it says nine feet, but six cubits in some different books say it's about 11 feet tall. That's, that, Caleb, how tall are you? See, he's already too big for me. He's 6'4". Uh, I'm already scared. You got a guy that's 11 foot or even 9 foot. Oh, my gosh. And if he's a big guy, yeah. So uh, the uh, six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head and his arm. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. I can only imagine that's heavy. He had bronze armor on his legs, bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. So someone's carrying a shield, and I'm sure his spear, 600 shekels, it, it, I don't know what that weighs. Dad could probably tell you. He stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out and line up for battle? I'm not a Philistine. I'm a Philistine, and you're the servants of Saul. Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words from the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephraimite of the, uh, Bethlehem of Judah, however you say that word, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons, and the man was old and advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had already gone to follow Saul to battle. So they've already, the prophet Samuel's already gone to their house. He's already anointed David. David actually already started going to Saul's chambers and started playing the harp for him because the spirit of the Lord had already started to leave Saul because God said, I've already rejected him, Samuel. So uh, he told Saul, he said, when you began, you were little in your own eyes. And then as the years went on, he started to cater to the uh, request of the people, of how he looked in front of the people. And so that's when, when the Lord said, I think the Lord gave him many chances when Saul went to battle. And with the Amalekites, he said, kill everything, don't spare anything. And then when they didn't, uh, Saul said, well, Samuel, the people, you know the people, they're being rebellious. They took a few things. And then he said, but we're going to sacrifice it to the Lord. And Samuel said, that's not what the Lord said. So really, obedience and serving is a really a huge deal because I've learned this with even working here that I'm not always serving the vision of what I want. I'm here to serve because God gives him the vision and what he told him to do because the Bible says in Numbers 13, he set a man over the congregation when he told Moses and he set Joshua. And so my goal is to serve his vision because God's gonna, God runs by chain of command. He's not... Um, you know, he, it's kind of like the military. I believe God invented the military. And so God gives him the vision. My goal is to see to it that as the, like, the anointing oil comes from the head of Jesus through the beard, which is like the leadership, to the body, which we are the hands and the feet of Jesus, my goal is, number one, is to see to it that that is actually happening. And then I'm not stopping the anointing oil. I'm not being a hindrance to that vision. And so, like he always says, uh, division is two separate visions. And so when people come in saying, I want to serve the way I want to, no, there, there was always God said, this is the way that I want things done. And so that's why David was such after God's heart, because he did things the way God wanted them done. And so, you know, I have to make, I've had to make a lot of a hard adjustments working here, because when he comes in and says, we're changing this and we're doing this, I'm like, yes, sir. And, you know, I'm walking out with a good attitude, even if I don't agree with it. My job is to, to serve the vision, and his vision is to grow Christians. And so I have to understand that vision. I have to see the vision the way he sees it and a way to implement it and check with him and saying, is this what we're, you're asking us to do? Because ultimately, uh, I know I'm going to stand before, you know, really we're serving Jesus. And people can see pastor and say, they can get so focused on, well, he's a man and that I'm, you know, and that his personality. But you have to look past that and say, if Jesus put him as a head of, the bo of this local body, then when I come in here, I'm serving the way he wants it done. And because that's the way you'd want it done if you were over a business or if you were over uh, a, a tr your own ministry. And so I believe that's the way that Jesus wants it done. So I, I've learned to go, no, it's not, it's not the way I want it done. But I, and pastor's always open to suggestions and if things need to change. And he's always apologized if he said, hey, I messed up. You know, he told us all recently, hey, listen, something happened. I screwed up. My bad. So I don't think he's like some ministries, you know, that's not, you do it my way and serve me. So that's right. Get that spider. 
So anyways, um, the goal is really to, is what Saul learned the hard way is that because he did not do what God had said through obedience, the kingdom was pulled from him. And so God takes obedience very, uh, very powerful. So anyways, uh, Jesse's three sons are at battle. David's the youngest, and the three oldest had already followed Saul. But, uh, but David occasionally went and returned to Saul to feed the sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistines drew near, presenting themselves for 40 days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son, David, take now for your brothers the ephod and this dried grain and these 10 loaves and run to your brothers at the camp and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of their thousands and see how your brothers fare. Bring back and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they had all men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. So the first thing you're gonna notice here is David serving his father. That's his first thing. The chapter before, David actually started to serve King Saul, playing for him. So David is already starting to learn uh, kind of the art of serving. So when he came, uh, 21, uh, he, uh, for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array of the army against the army, and David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers, and then he talked with them. There was a champion of the Philistines of Gath, Goliath, by the name coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, so David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who comes up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter and give him his father's house exemption from all taxes of Israel. So David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? David's already talking different. I wonder how he got there. He, his speech did not start there. His speech started a long time ago the way he was talking different. He's, le he's learned something at this point, and I'm going to go over some of that. And the people answered him and said this manner, saying, So shall it be for the man who kills him. So Eliab, his older brother, heard and spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David and said, Why are you come down here? And you've left those few sheep in the wilderness. I know your pride and the insolence of your heart for you've come down to see the battle. So a lot of times, godliness and the word in you, can, people can say you're full of pride. Your confidence in God. You're just full of pride. And so they're already, and then so David's going to answer back and say, uh, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? So it can already tell that I think David's brothers don't like him because he's like, what am I doing now again? So they're always probably harping on him. Then he, turned, uh, then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. So um, then 31, all the words were reported to Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Wow, that's a lot of bold words for a young boy. Your servant. So he's just saying, I'm, I'm at your command. You want me to go beat that 11 foot guy up? If I'm your servant, I'm at your command. That's like, you know, if dad told me to go take some 11 foot guy out, <laughs> I guess, I guess if, uh, if I'm, I'm serving you and the Lord's taking care of me, I'm gonna fight this guy. <laughs> so that's kind of a, a thing that, you know, in America, it's like, you know, hey, listen, uh, you know, I'm hired, but now I'm fired and I'm off the job. See you later, ha you know, have fun with that. And so, um, you know, even Prophet was telling me, even the police force, there's guys that, that'll get afraid in things, and then they don't want to go to a call or, or whatnot. And so, but think about this, that he has a covenant. He's talking different, and he's saying, your servant, I'm at your command. But, he's, but he knows God, and that's going to be the huge difference. So Saul said to David, you're not able to go up against the Philistines and fight with them, for you're just a youth. You're just a young man. He's been a man of war from his youth. David said to Saul, your servant's used, your servant, used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion and a bear came and took the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and the uncircumcised Philistines will be like the one uh, of them seeing them who's defiled the armies of the living God. David is talking as a young man about someone who must have had some experiences. Where is his confidence? He... he Nobody just walks up and says, I'm going to fight an 11-foot giant. The Lord had, must have been training him long before that because nobody just walks in talking that way. And God must have taught him to fight, right? So where did he learn that? I'm going to say the first thing, David served his father, Jesse. The second thing, he tended the sheep. 
which a sheep in that day is like you're basically on the, the level of a garbage collector. You're the lowest of the low. That's why his brother said, get back and go take care of the nasty sheep. Get out of here, you runt. And so, but David, his heart is, is what? It, he's not into the, the titles or I'm gonna you know, go to war. I'm just, I'm here to serve. I'm your servant. I think the third thing was David started fellowshipping with God. A lot of time in the pasture. And dad made a good point to me the other day. Um, then he started, he started worshiping the Lord. So the serving, now he's sing, because he's a psalmist, and he's singing the word. That's why I think he learned to talk different. So he's singing the word of God, and he's building God's words up inside of him. And then he sees a lion and a bear, and I'm sure the first time he saw a lion and a bear, he was probably sitting there, and the Lord said, pursue. And he's like, who, who what? Oh, all right. And he runs after it, and he, sh- and he strikes it. So that's not the first time that he's standing before a giant that he's fought a battle. God is training him in this area in the beginning. So a lot of times we just look at it and go, okay, David just made it straight to the throne. No, there's a whole process that I believe God started taking David through as he thinks he's a garbage collector. He's just a sheep. And God's saying, no, when you're washing them sheep, I'm going to train you. I'm going to teach you to read the word. I'm going to teach you to worship me. You're going to build your confidence. I'm going to teach you to, Psalm 144, I'm going to train your fingers for battle. So God's probably teaching him kung fu moves out there, and he's probably slapping lions and bears and jumping on them and choking them and hitting them, and God's saying, do this and do this and stab them here, and David's like, oh, my goodness, you know. So he says, the Lord trains my fingers for war, for battle. So because a young boy, uh, you know, that's like Christian walking in the military and saying, I'm going to go find Osama bin Laden. Give me that AR-15. I'll go in there, and I'll bring him out right now, you know. And You have to have some confidence. There has to be some training. There's got to be some background you don't, nobody just walks up to a fight and fights the biggest guy without any training. I mean, some people do, but then they get knocked out. And that, that's happened to me before, so. He learned how to talk from the Psalms. Um, somebody had to remind David he was a youth because somehow he saw himself different. You know how dad was talking about imagination? David, they said, look, you're just a young boy. And I think David goes, I, I haven't thought about that in a while. <laughs> Why? the presence of God. He's spending time with God. He's starting to think like God. He's starting to think completely different, and I believe this is what's training him to be the king. And so, um, oh, I'm not to number nine yet, so we're gonna keep going. Your servant has both killed the lion and the bear, and the uncircumcised Philistines will be like one of them. Seen has defiled the armies of the living God. So somehow he has an understanding of what? The covenant. His brothers aren't talking this way. They must have not been reading their Bible. Moreover, David said, the Lord will deliver me from the paw of the lion. He's got a lot of confidence in God. The Lord deliver me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear. He'll deliver me from this hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. There's a lot of confidence in God. Where did that confidence come from? came from spending time with God. He knew, somehow he knew God. Saul clothed David with his armor and put a bronze helmet on his head and he clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened the sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot wear these, walk in these. I've not tested them. So David took them off. So I think David's trying to serve Saul and to please him. But really David has to be what? He's got to be confident in what God, and his own skin, his own personality, what God's called him to do, and not be like everybody else. It's okay. Dad doesn't have to be Jesse Duplantis or Kenneth Copeland. He's just supposed to be him. So take off whatever, whatever's around you, what other people want you to be, and just say, he just said, look, I'm not trained in this armor. I just have to do what I know. And then that's exactly what he did. They, so he took a staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag and the pouch which he had and the sling which was in his hand and he drew near the Philistine. Philistine came and began drawing near to David and a man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh of the birds in the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, like Mark Hagen says, David had learned to talk back. That's not the first time that Satan's talked to him. So David is already learning about his confession and his mouth and he learned that from what? He learned it from God. That's probably not the first time Satan has spoke to David. And as soon as Goliath says something, David's firing right back with the word. 
said, God's going to deliver me from your hand. In the name of the Lord and the host and the armies of God, whom the Israel you've defiled this day, he will deliver me and you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camps of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. And all the earth may know that there's a God of Israel. Amen. And this assembly will know that the Lord does not save with the sword and the spear. For the battle is the Lord's. He will give you into my hands. So David is saying it's not by sword. It's not by spear. It's not by might. But it's going to be by your spirit. Where did he learn that? There's a lot of things in the story. So the Lord will kind of... The other night, I'm sitting on the couch, and I'm just kind of staring at my phone. The Lord said, you should open up 1 Samuel 17 and start reading. So I started reading. He said, look at, I want to show you some things that David started doing. And so it's really, as a kid, I just always saw David just running straight and killing this giant. Woohoo! But there is so much to the story that David had already begun happening to David for, through a preparation process. Yes. As God is trying to get David into the throne. And this is not the first time that he has learned about his confession, his mouth, his words, and what he's saying and talking back to an enemy. And so, and then he's learning, David already learned that it's not going to be by my might, it's going to be by his spirit. I'm not going to make this happen. It's going to be by him. So he's learning to walk and rely totally on the Holy Spirit. That when Samuel poured the anointing on David, it actually said from that day forward the Holy Spirit was upon him. So now I believe that's what started talking to him and teaching him. And so, so David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, verse 49, slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. And that stone, that stone sank into his forehead and fell on the face of the earth. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in, in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it out of a sheath, killed him and cut off his head with him. And the Philistines saw that their champion was dead and they fled. Now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistine as far as the entrance of the valley of the gates of Ekron and wounded, and the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road of somewhere, even as far as Gath of Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. David took the head of the Philistine, brought it to Jerusalem, and put, on his, and put the armor in his tent. Uh, he hung it up as like a trophy, like a, like a deer head. And when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, your soul lives king. I do not know. He was serving in call, Saul's courts the chapter before, and Saul doesn't even know who he is. I just thought, I was like, what well, in the world? You're, he's playing the harp. David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine. Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistines in his hand. Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I'm son of Jesse the Bethlehemite. So what ends up happening, verse eight, chapter 18, Saul took him on that day and says, I'm not gonna let you go back to your father's house. You're gonna serve me. And the Bible says that David is gonna behave wisely. Saul, verse five, sets him over the men of war and was accepted in the sight of all the people and the sight of Saul's servants. So one thing, and I don't know, Oh my gosh, time is flying by. So what ends up happening with David, and I'm gonna, because I listened to this through the uh, NLT has this like audio version of the Bible and you can just sit there and listen. So David is gonna start serving Saul. And when Saul says go to war, David goes to war. And David fights and prevails. And then he comes back and Saul goes, go to war here and David's gonna go to war. And then Saul's gonna see that the hand of the Lord's upon him and that Saul's gonna start to get jealous because the women are gonna sing, David has his 10,000s and Saul his thousands. And so Saul's gonna throw a spear at David and, sh and try to hit him. And David's gonna run out and then he's gonna come back in. He's gonna serve Saul again. Saul's gonna throw another spear at him. And David's gonna be like, okay, you know what? And then Saul says, go back on the front lines and fight again. So David goes back and fights. And then David's, and then so, you know, this time, and then, so then uh, Saul's going to try to trick him, and he's going to like, hey, I want you to marry my first daughter. And he's going to go, you have to go fight the Philistines. Oh, and then he says to his commander, I hope David dies in the front of battle. So David wins. Okay, David, I'll give you my second daughter. This is for real this time. So Saul's already tricking him. David says, yes, sir, I'm at your command. I'm your servant. I'll fight him if you want me to, Saul. So he goes out and fights him. And he wins and prevails. And, and Saul says, you bring me 100 foreskins. And David says, I'll do you better. I'm going to bring you 200 foreskins. So David does what? He's going above and beyond the call of duty for what his job. I mean, he's, I mean, he's not just there to serve, but he's going, I'm going to take it to another level of serving. And Mark talks about that in his book. And so Saul's even becoming more afraid. And he throws another spear at David. And this time David's going, oh my gosh, this guy's trying to kill me. But what's funny to me is, I mean, if you read this, Saul like four or five times throws a spear at David and David does what? He keeps serving him. 
I mean, imagine a pastor like chucked a spear back there at Teresa. <laughs> or like shot his bow. Maybe like pulled his pistol out and put a bullet right on the next to the wall because he's a good shot. I mean, are you going to keep serving, pastor, if he shoots a gun at you? Probably not, right? <laughs> I mean, after four bullets, you're probably like. <laughs> so i kind of trying to think of this in today's terms. And David is what? No, he's the king of Israel. I'm going to serve him. This is what the Lord's told me to do. Oh, my gosh, that's a, that's, a hard, that's a hard thing to think about. You're going to serve somebody who's being evil and is going to try to beat you up? And so David starts to run for his life. And then he spares Saul, and he keeps pleading with Saul. And then Jonathan pleads with Saul. And Saul kind of teeter-totters back and forth. And then finally David goes and joins the Amalekites. Or um, he, joined, he went into Gath to basically where Goliath family has fled. And then he serves that king for a while. And then they're going to go to war, and David's going to go to war with the enemy against Israel. And the uh, leader of Gath said, hey, why don't you go back? Because the people don't want you fighting with us. They think you're going to turn. So David said, yes, yes, sir. And he goes back. And um, they fought, and they prevailed, and they beat Israel, and they killed Saul, and they killed his son. They killed all of the sons, and then David assumes the throne after that. And so God worked it out. David didn't have to make the kingship happen. God did it for him. David, I mean, David served Saul. David served the enemy. <laughs> I mean, you start reading the story like, this is a screwed up drama. <laughs> and David starts fighting his enemy's enemies, and it's just like, good Lord, this is a mess. But David eventually had got into the throne. And so I want to I wanna read something in um, 1 Timothy 4. Right? For physical exercise has some value, but godliness is valuable in every way, and it holds to the promise of the present life and the life to come. Because I want to talk to you about Jonah. So he's saying that even in the life to come, uh, you're going to see something. And I want to I want to sh- um, uh, see if I can find the story about Jonah. Basically, Jesse runs up to Jonah and says, Jesse goes to heaven, and it is from this experience he gets sucked out of this hotel room that he's staying at because he's preaching for this guy for a week. And he gets there, and Abraham's there. And he bows before Abraham, and Abraham says, get up. The only person you bow before is the the king of kings. We are here to serve you. And he was like, this is a patriarch of old. This is Abraham, and he's got like this gold gauntlet. He's like, you need to take from the spring because you're not in a glorified body. You have to drink from the water. And so Abraham says, we're all here to serve, every one of us. And so as uh, then he goes on, and he gets to Jonah, and um, this is what he says. He says to Jonah, but he says, boy, you were in that whale, but man, how was it being in that fish? And he says, he seems to me that he hesitated as though he felt discontent just for a second. I felt that maybe I had brought on an unpleasant event to his memory that he almost had forgot. Then Jonah corrected me and said, no, I was in disobedience. Disobedience, I repeated, realizing that I had focused on the wrong part of his story. So disobedience, he said, is a powerful thing against you, not only in this life, but the life that's there. And so that's when I was reading that scripture. Physical exercise has some value, but godliness is valuable even in every way. It holds to the promise of the present life that is to come. And so David actually in this book starts taking Brother Jesse around. And he's serving Brother Jesse. And he says David was the only one he saw that was wearing a crown on his head. And he said there may have been others. And so there's this one part. I want to read this really cool part because I have a few minutes. I saw God's throne. I felt weaker and weaker as we approached the throne room. It looked like to me like millions of people were there. Looking around, I saw 24 empty seats near the throne. I said, I've read the scriptures about the 24 elders in Revelation. Those are their seats. Where are they? Jesse, we're servants here. David told me as he had earlier that they're out in the city and in paradise blessing and helping the people. We're here to help people. Everyone serves. Somebody is always trying to do something for you. Someone will always ask you, what can I do for you? Even the flowers turn towards you in an attitude of service. They look, they turn and look at you. They don't have eyes, but they know you're there. And you can't smash them. They go through your legs. I would look down at the flower. I had stepped on and think, why didn't I smash it? You can't kill anything there. There's no destruction. After seeing how everyone served each other in heaven, I don't think God is looking for brilliant, uh, brilliant individualist. I believe he's looking for team players. I remember the account in the Bible when James and John, the son of Zebedee, asked Jesus how they could have a special place in heaven. And Jesus says, whosoever wants to be great among you will be your minister, and who wants to be the chiefest will be servant of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to minister unto, but to minister and to give his life 
as a ransom for many. And so um, I started, there's a video of him online of Jesse Duplantis going to heaven, and it's about nine months ago he did it. You should watch it. He tell, everything that's in that book, he says it. And it is, I mean, powerful. Just because when he said that about Jonah, about disobedience, and I'm like, oh, there's actually a scripture that says that your godliness will actually affect in the life to come and how, and how you really live. And he said in the book that people who got saved that didn't really do anything for Jesus and serve him, they got a garment of salvation, like in the book of Isaiah. They'll receive a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. And the ones that did serve the Lord, they'll get a robe of righteousness. And he said they will eventually get to the throne but they will have to be taught the oracles of God. Just like the aborted children, he said, when God gives the children to the earth, he receives them back and they have to grow up and learn the oracles of God, the ways of God. And the angels will teach them, the people will serve and teach the children, and even the mothers that they pass away will actually teach their own children. But the children are waiting for them to come back. But it was amazing to me how the, the garment of salvation, he said people still have to learn the ways of God. And they'll eat the fruit and the, the, the leaves and the fruits at what's called the healing of nations as they make their journey to the throne. And even he said he saw Paul. He was, Paul was teaching people. And Paul said, I can't wait for you to come back because I got so much to teach you. And he said, Paul, what was the greatest thing about your life on earth? He said, I did not know Jesus was going to take my letters to the church and put them in a book. Paul was just serving the church. He was just writing letters of encouragement, of revelation. He was just saying, and, and, then, and Jesus said, the way Paul served me, I'm going to put his words in a book. And Paul said, he said, um, you know that scripture that my affliction is, for a, is but for a moment? He said, tell the people of earth to turn it back to a moment. He said, the church has made it into a lifetime. My affliction is but for a moment. He said, it's just for a moment. The things you go through in this life, the things you go through day to day, it's just a moment. And, and people have just said it's, they think it's a lifetime on all these trials and said, no, take that faith and put it back to a moment. And Paul said to him, he said, so what are you doing now? He said, I am preparing for my eternal work. And I heard, um, what is her name? Uh, Jean Ann or Jean uh, Wilkerson, Jeannie Wilkerson. She trained Mary Fran and she's got a book called Contact with a God. And she said, God is qualifying you for an eternal position. I think God's just seeing if you're going to be obedient to him. How are you going to serve him? I mean, think about forever and eternity. And that God's just saying, like King David, can you just do what I, do what I, he said, this man, David, is after my heart, for he wants to do all of my will. And I believe that we may not always know exactly at the moment what that looks like, but I can tell you one way you can serve, you can pray for your pastor. The Bible says pray for those in authority. Pray for him. Pray that he's getting a revelation so he can share it with us, that we would know the oracles of God. We would know the things of God. You can serve in your time and your finances, your local church. You can serve one another in the needs of the saints, like in the book of Acts, that they would bring the money and distribute it among all, that each person would have enough or to pay off their debts or whatever it was. They, they were serving each other. Like Miss Rosa, for the last few months, she just came in and said, the Lord told me to, Make you tacos while you're in school and you're working so hard. Uh, man, what a blessing that was. Just, she's just serving wherever the Lord puts on her heart, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves someone who's cheerful, a prompt to do it, that their heart is what? It's in their giving. And so um, you serve your generation to the will of God. You'll have to find that out. And Jesus says, if my, I honor myself, my honor is nothing. And, uh, and, and Jesus says, the honor I'll receive is going to be from my Father. And so I believe that promotion comes from the Lord and that you don't have to fight for it. You don't have to. Um, King Saul was doing everything he could to make sure that David was not getting promoted. And, and, it never ha and he, never, he couldn't stop it. And so I believe that David started realizing that when he had a covenant with God, like he told Goliath, that there was nothing that was going to stop him. And so I, I just, I know I'm, gonna, I'm probably going to end a, actually a little early, but I am going to read maybe one thing out of this book. Um, just because after um, Joshua was anointed to serve Moses, honor 
It says that Joshua, the son of Nun, Deuteronomy 34, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and he did all that the Lord Moses commanded him. And so it says that set a man before the congregation and anoint him and lay some of thy honor upon him. So Mark Hagen says that honor, you can grow in honor. You can grow, and he said some of it. So that means that you can actually increase in that. You can increase in your serving. And so really Joshua received that, and he makes a good point in this book. He said that the honor wasn't placed on just anyone. Joshua received it because of his relationship with Moses, the way he served. Joshua did not get the anointing because of who Moses was, but he got it because who Moses was to him. And so Moses, who literally carried the authority of God, was able to place some of that honor and that authority on Joshua through the laying on of hands in the same way Timothy loved and served the apostle Paul. Paul embraced Timothy as his son and imparted the anointing to him because of the way he served. But you know his proven character that it was the son of the father that he served me with the gospel. The same thing with Elisha. Now the anointing is not just on the fivefold. Every person has the anointing on them. Some people have an anointing to sing. Some people have an anointing to do art and to paint. Some people have an anointing to do business. But I believe it's how you serve the Lord in that. And it's how you serve your, the leaders. And how I've, I mean, I've learned to serve him and Pastor Mark that are above me, that that's the way that that anointing increases in your life. And so as you begin to seek the Lord on that and say, I had asked the Lord, this person's coming. Should I, what would you like me to do for them? Is there something in my heart? And then sometimes the Lord would be like, no, you just gave a huge gift for them for Christmas. That's enough. That's all I asked you to do. Okay, my friend's coming. That's it. She's coming in February. Uh, you know, I'm not buying or anything else, but I did it at that time. And I believe that the Lord had put that on my heart because in heaven, there's something that they're, they're, they got a revelation of in heaven, right? Why is everybody running around serving each other? They're, and that's, I guess they're all trying to go to the top, right? Because if the way down is up, and then everybody in heaven serving each other. There's a revelation of serving there, and the angels serve, the patriarchs serve, and so there's something in the power of serving that I don't even fully understand yet. I don't even have, I mean, this is just the Lord's been showing me some of these small little things about serving that I'm sure there's way of serving and honor. There's more, and I've just kind of asked the Lord, start showing me um, how to serve him better, and the people around me, if I'm to minister to people, and it's not that you become a doormat, like Pastor Mark says, and you're not a pushover, and you don't let people run over you, and they just control your life, and they call you all the time, and they, you know, because the Lord told me one time, I need you to go home and study, to serve me better, and to serve more people soon. But if you're running around helping this one person all the time that I didn't tell you to help, you're not serving me, you're serving them. But we are to serve people. But a lot of times the Lord will be like, I want you to spend time with this person. I want you to go over to this person's house. I want you to hang out with this person. And then he'll say, I want you to pull away and study with me. And so um, my heart is to serve Jesus. And it's not that the church, sometimes people think that the church is just supposed to serve and pastors are going to run around and do all the hospital visits and he's just going to serve and, and that he's just supposed to. No, the Lord appointed a man over the congregation to serve who? The Lord. And so people think, pastors like the story about the man who said, Pastor, I thought you were going to come to the hospital and read the Bible to me all day. That's not his job. His job is to minister to the saints for the work of ministry, but it's not to just to be a doormat for one person or maybe that whatever the pastor wants all the, or this person wants all the time, hey, it's your local church, sir, you know, you're supposed to be serving us, the people. No, Saul got in trouble for that, serving just the, the people's interest. God said, what did I tell you to do? And I think in our own lives, you're going to have to even protect that. Because the Lord told Jesse, if Satan cannot get you in sin, he's going to get behind you and push you into the grave early. Because he don't care if you're in hell, because he's got you, and he don't care if you're in heaven, because you're off the earth and you're not bothering him. And so Satan will push people who live right and who are doing the work of the Lord and that, I mean, that's sometimes I go, well, how in the world is my phone ringing all day long? I, I need this and I need this. Hey, can you help me do this? And I'm thinking, good Lord. And when I realize that if Satan can get you off of your assignment and push you and you get frustrated at people and then you're worn out and you're tired and then you're like, Lord, take me to heaven, man. I'm tired of this. But really you're serving him here is actually more detrimental to Satan because you're causing such a great change in people's lives. And so I challenge every person 
that as we grow as a church and we open up more ways to serve and that the Lord has you in school and in business and your workplace, just learn to serve where you're at. So learn to serve, you know, if you're with your parents, you serve your parents. If you're with your boss, you serve your boss and, and let the Lord open up because what it does is it takes selfishness out of you. And I heard Kevin McNulty tell me, he said, my mom spent her whole life and Dr. Kevin was travel with Dr. TL and his mom served the ministry, she served other people. And he said, my mom never really did anything for herself. She was always serving. And I thought, man, what a wasted life, man. There was so much she could have done. Her, what about her dreams? I'm realizing now, she had a revelation of something that maybe I didn't quite understand when I was younger. That what she was serving her generation according to the will of God. And I believe there's a huge reward for Dr. Kevin's mother. And that's why Dr. Kevin's probably over in Russia putting up 100 tents because of the way his mother served. Joel Osteen, people are, you know, they, don't, they, they can't figure out why Joel Osteen, his church is so massive. Well, Joel Osteen said, my goal is to serve my father and to make him look good. And I believe that God, not only through Joel serving his father, but Joel's father and mother serving the Lord in their generation, God has like put double honor on them. And, and he said, my main goal is I'm to preach hope. And a lot of people don't like Joel. They think he's scammed this and that. But I think he tapped into a spiritual truth that whether people like it or not, he's got a massive ministry. And, and they think it's, he just somehow swindled a lot of old women and their money. But I think <laughs> what they don't understand is he served his generation. He served his father. His mother and his father served their generation according to the will of God. And because he made his dad look good on camera, then God says, I'll make you look good. And so I just, I challenge every person. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know where you're supposed to be. And I believe as you say, you know, you spend more time like David. Uh, he didn't go from the pasture just to the throne like in the kids' movies. There was such a preparation of time that David put in to knowing God's voice, learning and training God, molding him to say, even to Saul, yes, sir, every time I'm your servant, I'm at your hand, what would you like me to do? And so I just challenge every person to say, Lord, how do I serve my generation according to the will of God? And that one day when we're all in heaven, you know, we're all wearing our robes of righteousness and we're serving one another and, you know, helping each other. And Poppy's still probably going to be bringing me eggs in heaven. I don't know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that uh, for a truth about serving, that you would expand on us, that you would give a revelation. You told me years ago that you said, and Jesus said, in my Father's house, there are many mansions, many rooms, or many dwelling places. And if I have not told you so, I'm going to go prepare a place. I believe there's many rooms in the kingdom of God of honor, of serving, of righteousness, of prosperity. There's so many rooms that we could tap into of learning about these, these, these truths that are in the word. And I pray that you'd open them up. I pray that every person in here, Father, would serve you according to the will of God for their generation, that every person, when they hit the grave, that they would say that person is completely empty of all the gifts of God. They left them in people on this earth and they deposit them in people. I pray in the night, Father, you would touch people. I pray just in the service you would touch people with where they're, they're the servant, what they're supposed to do with their life. Like King David, he knew, he knew, he said, my one goal is not to be king. It is to serve God and be after his heart. And I pray, Father, as we're after your heart, that you begin to place in us in the positions that each person, Father, here, I believe is strategically here tonight because you're saying, I want you to understand this truth about serving. And I thank you and I bless you and I bless pastors Daryl and Lisa for letting me serve them and it's an honor to serve in this pulpit father it's an honor to serve you I don't take this lightly you said my house shall be called a house of prayer and it is your house father we are here to serve you according to the will of God and I thank you for the opportunity that each person has that we're serving you're opening up new doors and visions and dreams and revelations in Jesus name amen pastor Morgan I took went three minutes over do you have anything to say or should I tell him to go home? Yeah. Pastor said you can go home. <laughs> Love you guys.